afternoon, everybody. It is so lovely to have you here for our next live learning session with somebody who um, professionally I just admire so greatly, but then also personally just love this human as one of the greatest people I know. Um, and so today we're going to kind of unpack a, a bit of a tricky topic in schools, I think, because it's easy to kind of park this in the place of potentially parents or people outside of the school. But we know that bullying and, um, and any of that kind of uh, disjointed or, or lack of harmony between friendship groups for young people plays such a huge role within our schools. And so we're going to chat to Lucy, who is co-CEO of Project Rocket around some of the strategies that her and her company have developed over decades working within this space. To start off though, I just wanna acknowledge the traditional owners on the land in which we live, work and play and just particularly hold some space given that it's NAIDOC week this week, which is a really incredible week for us to pause and acknowledge um, the oldest living culture on this planet and how fortunate we are um, to live, work and play on the same land as this wisdom and heritage. Normally for me, um, this would be Yagara and Turrbal land up in Mianjin, um, but I find myself down in South Australia, so I want to pay my respect to the Ghana people and all of the other Indigenous and First Nations and Torres Strait Islander people um, that have created this incredible culture um, that we're fortunate to live in in this present day. Luce, you know I hate a bio read. It's not my jam on the best of days. So I, I'm not going to do what would be a disservice to what I know is a pretty awesome bio. Um, can you tell us a little bit about you? Introduce who you are and then tell us a little bit about maybe what you've done up until now and then tell us a little bit about Project Rocket and obviously the work that you lead with that organisation as well. Yeah, I would love to. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me today. It's lovely to meet you all and um, I, the respect and love is mutual with Nick. I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm coming from today the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and happy NAIDOC everyone. In my opinion, it's the best week of the year and it should be every every week of the year. Um, but also I really wanna start by acknowledging that my career has been built around tackling issues of bullying, hate and prejudice in a country with a continuing history of bullying, hate and prejudice. So everything I have to say, all of the learning and all of the advice is centered um, in, in honoring that and the leadership and activism of our Aboriginal elders whose footsteps I follow in. Um, but yeah, it's lovely to be here today. And to give a bit of context, I guess, as to how I came to be doing this work, it's a bit of a, a very random career. Um, and I think if you told year nine me that one day I would be having conversations with year nines about issues of bullying and prejudice, I would have laughed out loud. I would have, yeah, I, I was not the kind of kid that saw myself ever in a role like this. Um, yeah, I think like growing up, I, I wanted to be a lot of different things. I was one of those kids that jumped around. Uh, the earliest job that I wanted was to be a detective. And I think I was around grade three when I actually tried to change my name. This is so cringe. I tried to change my name and announced it to my whole grade three class that from now on they had to call me Gumshoe um, because I really wanted to be a detective. And then I became a bit science obsessed and I remember going along to a, one of mum's dinner parties and all the adults laughing because they asked me what I wanted to be. And I was like in grade five and I said, a forensic scientist and apparently that's not a very standard grade five aspiration um <laughs> but then hitting secondary school i went to a, a really big independent school down here in melbourne um and i was one of the scholarship kids which meant that my role in school was kind of set up around participating in everything and you know so all of the extra sport and music and trying really hard to get good grades and i remember the number of times that my mum reminded me that I better remember all the opportunities that I had because I'm at this school and I better not miss out on any of those opportunities. Um, and so, yeah, like I had heaps of uh, heaps of opportunities, but even for us in our family, paying for the uniform was still a really big cost. Um, and so I had it internalized that I had to make the most of every, every opportunity as a kid. Um, and so, yeah, I think growing up, I was a bit of a floater. I definitely felt distinctly not like the other kids. And I think that's a really universal experience of adolescence. Like we all feel the one thing we all have in common growing up is that we all feel weird. Like, um, And that's probably a big part of Project Rocket and what we've learned to kind of 
own and discuss and celebrate and find connection through um, in our workshops. But yeah, had many kind of aspirations. I think at different points, I wanted to be a scientist, as I said, or a sports person or an outdoor ed teacher. Um, and when I finished school, I remember the moment that Ro and I, my little sister and I first dreamt up Project Rocket. I think it wasn't ever supposed to be anything other than a community project that we thought, oh, you know what we'll do? We'll do this community project. We'll unite some young people against bullying and in some way we'll have contributed to building a kinder world. Um, at the time, Ro had just graduated high school and I was a couple of years older than her. And we could really see that the dominant approach to tackling issues like bullying and cyber bullying was missing one very crucial ingredient, any genuine buy-in from young people. And we saw that as a bit of an issue. So yeah, we weren't aiming to build a career or launch an organization. We just wanted like someone to shake up the problem. And I think that's when we decided to have a crack at it ourselves. So that's how we came to be at the, at the point of starting Project Rocket, Nick. Um, and as you know, from there, it's kind of evolved with a whole bunch of experiments, failures, sticky tape, blue tack, um, and, and a whole lot of real time experience as well, working with high school students. So let's dig into that, because I think if you're a Victorian based school, the Project Rocket brand is so well established, but for potentially, I know certainly for some of the schools that I work with in Queensland or, you know, going further, a little, a little bit further north, the work that you do might not be familiar to some of the educators that are perhaps tuning into this. Um, what does the Project Rocket portfolio look like? And, and maybe could you step us through, like, where did it start? What was kind of the work that Project Rocket started doing? And then how has that work evolved or shifted, particularly through, I know, some of the key partnerships that you've developed over the last sort of five years, especially? Um, what do you do? And talk, talk to us about that. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, so starting out, um, I'm not sure about you folks, but... Um, yeah. When I was in school, if you told me I was about to do a participate in a workshop on bullying, I would have expected the absolute worst. Um, I would have expected a, a lecture or something really terrifying or something about cyberbullying that's focused only on all of the things that can go wrong. Um, and when we started creating our own school workshops and piloting them in Melbourne, we decided that they'd be built on evidence and aligned with curriculum, but most importantly, they'd be animated through actual youth lived experience. And so the workshops kind of have this approach that they're expert designed, peer delivered. Um, and so early on, we, we, we came up with this kind of approach and built out a suite of workshops, which I'll get to, and then decided that as a, we'd operate as a social enterprise, and our, our vision at Project Rocket is of a world where kindness and respect thrive and every young person is free to realise their potential. We decided that we'd be the kind of business that employs young people and actually runs our business to help realise young people's potential. Um, so we started recruiting and training other young people who'd finished school um, and building out some early evidence of that impact, um, getting out there into schools around Melbourne. And very quickly, we, we started out in 2006. So at the time, Facebook's two years old. You can imagine the growth of our organization has completely mirrored the growth and explosion of social media and all of the associated challenges. Um, and so for us, pretty soon, some of those big tech companies started noticing our work and wanting to team up with us. And pretty soon we started hearing from schools in WA or Atherton or Broome all over the place um, and having this challenge of building out, tr trying to grow this team really rapidly. Um, those, we did set up some really early partnerships with tech companies, like the Telstra Foundation was a really early supporter. Um, Facebook was now we now, now known as Meta. And working with those, with those partners enabled us to kind of seize digital innovation as an avenue to reach students all over Australia, irrespective of their geographic barriers or socioeconomic barriers, but also to really deepen the impact beyond a one-off experience where some cool people come to your school and then they leave the next day. Um, so yeah, th I'd say that there's been what we, we essentially have a suite of eight workshops for primary and secondary school students. They tackle bullying, but bullying is really, I think I'm speaking to the kind of teachers that will understand this. In many ways, bullying is just the foot in the door. Um, often it takes an issue like bullying or online safety to engage school leadership to kind of make a call that it's important to you know set up a program like this but when we're on the ground we're really talking about identifying your values um, taking positive risks strategies to call out friends behavior um, building a literacy around diversity and appreciation of different perspectives as well as that kind of critical thinking and 
um, safe online behavior, but also digital participation skills and voice. Um, so the workshops are kind of built built around that, but really the growth and the scale has been enabled through partnerships, um, through growing the social enterprise model and through digital. So what started small has now grown into what we call ourselves Australia's youth driven movement against bullying, hate and prejudice. We've now reached over half a million young Aussies, which blows my mind. Like honestly blows my mind. Many of them, like, because as Nick said, the, the company has quite a bit of brand awareness in Melbourne. It's not uncommon for me to be at the supermarket being served by someone who says, hey, you came to my school in year eight, which is always kind of weird. Um, but it's amazing. Now they're applying. Now we've got former Project Rocket student participants applying for jobs as well. So it's kind of come full circle. That's awesome. I love that. Um, I acutely remember getting my first phone and it was um, like one of those Sony Ericsson flip, flip flip phones and it was blue and I was 18. So I like had left school when I first got a phone and, and all it could do was like text message and you had was it 146 or characters or something similar and you had to like go A to get to C you had to press like the number one button three times like you know, the limitations on this device were pretty huge compared to what our devices do now. And so whilst I was at school, given that mobiles um, didn't exist and the internet wasn't really a thing, it was like a dial-up situation, the only way for my friends to reach me was to call the landline that was hanging in the kitchen um, right where my mum was always standing. And so she would answer the phone. And if they didn't articulate, you know, hi, my name is may I please speak to using all the correct like you know language my mum would be like no you know and hang up and I was similar to you scholarship kid at an all-girls school my gosh like if a boy rang like hang up no you know Nicole's not available <laughs> um, so you know my parents like were um, the guardians I guess in how I interacted with my friends outside of school and as an adult, I reflect back on that now. And whilst it probably at the time was frustrating for teenage me, in some ways, I feel quite grateful for the protection that that guardianship offered from the accessibility. It, it made it much safer for me in a lot of ways. Technology now for young people growing up has just completely transformed like the landscape. So when we talk about when you started Facebook only being like two years old, tech not being a thing, how has technology transformed the landscape when we talk about some of those challenges that you're working with schools and students? Yeah, wow, what a transformative time in humanity. Um, and yeah, I love that image of you nervously waiting to see whether your mum would hand over the phone to you. That's great. Um, it is, as I said before, it's really weird that the rise of social media has completely mirrored the growth of our organisation. Uh, it's not lost on me. It's it's a real paradox. On the one hand, you know, when we started Project Rocket, Facebook was literally in nappies. It was two years old. Instagram didn't exist. I had, wouldn't have known what Snapchat was. Um, and, you know, sadly, that explosion of social media has fueled the issues that we're trying to tackle. And at the same time, uh, we can't throw the, throw the whole thing in the bin. It's also created so many more avenues for connection and participation um, and acceptance and belonging as well, especially over the past couple of years, uh, right, through COVID. And I think um, what we tend to see is a really polarised conversation when it comes to online safety, where well-meaning adults, grown-ups, want to protect young people from all of the harms and risks of being online. So I'm talking here about worrying about their uh, mental health impacts or loss of social connection, worry about exposure to unsafe content or reputational damage, or predators and we want to but still make sure they have all the good experiences the educational opportunities the yeah the capacity to express themselves the creativity the fun all of that and the challenge is that all of these experiences aren't it's not easy to separate them as we know um our digital world is boundaryless that bullying back in the day ended when the school bell rang whereas these days as we know it's 24 7 it it transgresses not only time but spaces in, in in terms of our domestic space and when we're on the train or at school or lying in our bed at night um and so yeah one of the real challenges is that the more time we spend online the more likely we are to encounter harms but also the more likely we are to encounter the benefits and we're living in a world that is so complex that it isn't possible to safeguard young people um 
And one of the challenges that I'd, I'd say with this whole approach is that when we attempt to protect young people, we often end up cutting them off from the opportunities and the supports that they'll need when they do inevitably encounter challenging times. So it is a really rapidly changing space. And at the moment, um, Project Rocket, we're doing a, a, a huge youth consultation process actually with the University of Western Sydney to get an insight into young people aged 12 to 18, their experiences of online safety education. It's probably not a surprise to people on the call, but the common theme so far are that they are sick of being told what, what to do and not do. They, they know um, much better, they're much more literate than any of us around the tools that are available on their devices. Um, and they're also sick of being told not, like, not to bully people online, um, obviously. But what they're finding is that there are no real conversations about the nuances and complexities of human experience and the way that these are playing out online. So when we tell a kid, um, don't send a private photo of yourself, we're not necessarily cutting through, when we give that advice, we're not understanding why they might be motivated to send a private photo. If we say, if someone does send a private photo of them to you, don't share it because you'll get a criminal record, that might be actually completely missing the mark of their reasoning. Um, we're not actually getting to the heart of the conversations around what it means to find, explore intimacy as a teen in a digital age or what it means to form connection or what, why consent, there are a lot of levels to what consent means to young people. And so how are we really unpacking and understanding what that's like? For someone who um, has been recently broken up with and has in their possession a very private photo, how do they cope with rejection so that they don't have to retaliate? How are we getting to the heart of these kind of deeper conversations? And I think that that's where the, the broader conversation is moving away from the that idea of protecting young people, telling them what tools to use, um, you know, blocking and reporting and muting and moving beyond the, you know, talking to your parent and more around the starting to unpack those complex, they're actually not about technology at all. They're age old complexities of learning to be a, a good human that you can be proud of online and offline as well. So it's it's a really wild time. And the last thing I'd say is that I think where, where social media is heading is much less about, you know, likes and follows on a platform and more about that immersive three-dimensional uh, AR, VR experience um, that, that further dissolves that boundary between online and offline. And I think young people, we're going to need to uh, give them a lot more trust so that they can lead us when it comes to this new frontier as well. There's a lot there in what I've just said, but it's it's fascinating um, and I think really hopeful as well. Mm. I um, We've probably like, uh, Lucy and I will probably chat for another 10 or 15 minutes, we'll let maybe two more questions. And so if there are questions that you're starting to have in the back of your mind, I'd love for you to drop them in the chat so that we can make sure that we sort of get to those. So if you're watching and you're like, oh, I really wanna know about this, or I've really got this burning question, please feel free to drop them in the chat um, whilst you think of them. Lucy, I'm really keen to, like, I think what you've talked about there around like the behaviour or the motivation for the choice is actually a really critical conversation to have. I remember being a year level coordinator like, a number of years ago and dealing with uh, like an issue of nude photos being distributed by boys in the year level. And I remember sitting down with one of the students whose photo had been shared and she was this, you know, really charismatic, seemingly confident young girl um, who, you know, in, in my head at the time, um, I was thinking, oh, like, you know, all the right things to do, you know, you know, you're not, you shouldn't probably send those photos, like in my head. And I remember sitting down and um, saying to this young person, like, oh, just talk to me about like, why? Like, tell me, I'd love to understand your perspective around um, why you sent, you know, that student the photo and, and talk to me about that experience and that choice that you made. And I, I'd really, I'm old, I didn't have technology when I was at school. Like, can you talk to me about like your reasoning? And it like her response is something that's haunted me, you know, maybe 10 years on. And she said, um, he told me that I was beautiful and I believed him. Um, and that was her reason for sending that photo and it's something that I've constantly reflected back on because I you're right me teaching that young person to mute or to block or not to do it or the you know consequences from a, a legal point of view were not stoppers to that choice it really came back down to the feeling that she had and then that drove her choice 
how do we, as educators in schools, what are some of the really tangible things that we can be doing better to support our young people in their decision making, whether it's online or offline in the relationships that they're having? What are some things that you've done really well? What are some things that schools can implement? Are there schools that are doing this really well that, that other schools can kind of look at? What are some examples of best practice or maybe not best practice, better practice maybe is the best way to phrase that. I love that. I think better practice is a little bit like thinking about safer spaces rather than safe spaces. It acknowledges that we're striving towards something that, you know, in the complexity we're dealing with is never 100% foolproof or possible. Um, I think one of the things that I want to draw out from what you've, you've just, the anecdote you just shared was around that the conversation about the why and our motivations and our drivers and um, the most common messaging that young people get, for example, around sharing nudes or, or leaking nudes is just don't do it. Just don't do it. And if you do, like it's like you'll go to jail. Um, actually, there are a lot of reasons. I, I, I won't speak so much to why people share nudes because I think, you know, we've been exploring our sexuality as human beings for you know, it's for generations. And I, in a way, the conversation around don't send nudes, it's like victim blaming. It's it, ultimately, it's a scenario where one person, aside from the legalities, one person's trusted another that they're supposedly in an intimate relationship with, with, a, with something that is very vulnerable and personal. And, and it, so it's a matter of consent. But it's interesting, the conversations that I had largely with young men about um, leaking, leaking these photos, they focus on don't do it or else you'll get punished. And it's really interesting, like there are a whole heap of other, like we're really underestimating young men's complexity and, and emotional and moral reasoning. There, in conversations with young people that we have, there are many reasons why not to send that photo. We've had young guys say things like, um, because it's disrespectful to her, or this is a more of a self-centered motivation, but because then no one else will ever send you photos like that again. So if you wanted more, you're not gonna get any. Um, Another more um, sentimental or nostalgic reason would be because it ruins what you had together, even if it's over. Um, and yeah, and, there, uh, and I guess coming back to that rights based perspective is because only she has the right to decide what happens to her image. So it's interesting that these conversations about why actually next time you're, you're, you're faced with the decision about passing on a photo and you, you can remember, you can, you've actually engaged with that level of moral reasoning is going to be so much more meaningful. So I think those conversations, I just want to honour as well that it's, teachers are in a really difficult position, especially when it comes to image-based abuse because of the legalities around young people sharing photos of even themselves. But I take that as just an example. And I, and I think that it, it is really difficult for educators um, when you wear all hats um, and you hold so many different kind of portfolio of responsibilities for, for your students. Um, which is why the second tip I'd give would be around student-led in interventions with this kind of thing. Um, one of our guiding principles at Project Rocket is young people at the centre. And that's out of the wisdom that we know they'll probably be better able to um, lead the way than us. Um, and ultimately that leads to ownership. So um, a couple of examples that I've seen working really well in the kind of online space. Uh, I was talking to a, a principal in, in Queensland who said a couple of weeks back, he said, that he needed to, he, was, he had to write the new mobile phone policy for students and he knew it was going to be very unpopular. So he actually got the students who were the most tech savvy and engaged to write the mobile phone policy themselves. Um, and there's still some dissonance among the student body around whether the rules are too harsh or not harsh enough. But ultimately, there's that ownership among the student body. Another example was a middle school leader who engaged turning post COVID and finding there was a lot of disengagement among a particular cohort within a year level, chose the students who had been in his office the most frequently for all the wrong reasons and formed a working group to actually work on student engagement in the school, which is so cool. And apparently these students are like, yeah, they, like they're the proud kind of poster kids for like, hey, we're the reason that school's awesome now and it's because of us. Um, and of course, we've seen some really remarkable, especially this year following COVID, but grassroots like celebrations of student identity around culturally diverse school canteen takeovers and cross year level lunchtime yarning circles. And I think that um, it's, it's I, I share this because although it might not be directly about bullying or online safety, these are the spaces through celebration and positive conversations where we can actually start to talk about the risks without 
without reverting to that binary of protecting versus protecting young people and cutting them off from participation um, as well. So the, the last thing I'd add there um, as well is possibly about the, some of the best interventions that I've seen um, coming from outside of schools. And so I'd include Project Rocket in this category, but some other initiatives as well, working in working in schools like Elephant Ed, um, the Man Cave, Batia, some other great youth, youth initiatives, and that they tend to avoid working with young people as like a homogenous group. Um, often when we talk about young people and we don't in include them, especially online, they end up being only defined by their age or generation. And I think it really frustrates this emerging generation because it erases their intersections of their identity. So we no longer think about a young person in terms of their gender or their belief system or their ethnicity or their socioeconomic access or their personality if we're only seeing them as a young person. Um, and so I think some of these broader conversations around identity are really pivotal because they start creating these spaces that young people might strongly, more strongly identify with in terms of another part of their identity. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And, and maybe where I'd love to, and I don't know if there's an answer to this question, but when we sort of work with uh, schools and systems around building enterprising mindsets. We've got like some foundations that we need to set before we move on to more complex like topics. Are there foundation concepts that schools and systems should maybe look to tackle or integrate first when they're looking at online safety? And I think we're, really what we're talking about is identity and like understanding yourself and like learning how to just be a good human who understands how to, you know, play well with others I know that's a really simplified version if we're talking about like that foundation principles is there one space that you would say cool schools should really start building this kind of culture or system or protocol first and then start to build out and sort of branch out into these other concepts is it as simple as looking at foundation principles and building out um I think yes and no I first of all I'd say I think the Australian curriculum is going to have to have a radical like drag transformation or something to keep up with this changing changing state of the new work order and tech and social media gosh um, we need another hour then, if we go into that yeah we, like, do. <laughs> we do but um but i would say that like a lot of schools especially with primary schools so we have lots of conversations with educators about the challenge of targeting primary school students with online safety skills when they're actually not supposed to be on the platforms just yet for example um, or in secondary schools where they have like a zero tolerance to cyberbullying and many of the issues that can't be unpacked. We don't want students to be talking about image-based abuse, but we know it's happening. Um, and it's a really difficult thing. Um, you know, we don't want them coming forward because it, it, it causes a whole bunch of legal challenges. But in many ways, schools are addressing online safety without even talking about technology if they're de developing students' emotional literacy if they're developing students critical thinking skills, if they're developing students glo perspectives and, and global literacy. Um, and so I'd say that I think we need to widen our view of online safety in a way the majority of young people know how to manage difficult situations online. They know how to deal with their privacy settings. The idea of keep your profile private is no longer relevant to a generation that needs to build a profile or a career or exercise their voice by having a public platform. Um, but really, it's about those kind of social and emotional competencies. Never before have they been so relevant to a young person's online experience. Um, and I say that because of the two disrupted views of relying on technology as our only tether to each other as well. So I would just say that I think, um, yeah, the, the way that we need to move is by thinking about the core skills and capabilities and, and competencies that young people need to, to have not only a safe online experience, but a thriving online experience. And that really widens widens the net of the conversations that and the connections, I guess, that we're drawing in in those conversations to technology as well. It's such an interesting reflection. If I think back to, you know, 10 years in education working within schools and the bulk of that time in pastoral care roles where I was leading cohorts and, you know, responsible for kind of integrating this learning within the one lesson a week that we had allocated to tackle being a human. Um, I don't think at any point we ever covered content around how being online could actually help you 
I don't ever remember sitting down and talking about the positive aspects of an online profile, thinking about LinkedIn to build your professional brand or thinking about other online spaces and how you can use them to build connection and build community and build awareness and educate yourself. And what are all the pieces that we're not talking about when it comes to online safety like that? This gets me so excited. Um, okay, so recently in one of our, we're doing a bunch of work for Meta, the platform formerly known as Facebook, about building the future of the internet This through 3D headsets and what, what the internet's gonna look like in 10 years. And as part of this youth consultation last week, I heard a young man say, 17 year old, elite swimmer, um, and he has a cochlear implant. And so he, what his love and his passion is being in the water and swimming. But he's never been able to go deep sea diving because his ear, the way his, his structure is, is that he can't go too deep. So he used VR um, to experience deep sea diving, swimming with fish. And I, I can't quite imagine how it would be the same. He obviously has spent so much time. I imagine it a bit like when you've been bouncing on a trampoline all day and you lie in bed and you still feel like you're bouncing on a trampoline. I think he's so close to imagining what it's like to be immersed in water. But he found it a very emotional experience swimming even in VR. Um, because it's an experience he will never, never otherwise have. It's creating possibility and accessibility that isn't otherwise possible. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite remarkable. We're hearing from communities that we've never heard from before, uh, you know, acknowledging that the way my social media feed is lighting up this week is a celebration of NAIDOC that isn't just about chosen and public representative, publicly representative ambassadors. It's everyday young people saying, I'm here, I'm getting up, I'm standing up, I'm showing up, this is it. Um, another one of the young participants in our, our Metaverse, our recent youth consultation, is, is a, a young disability advocate who successfully, one of her favourite pop stars, um, released a song that had an ableist slur in it, and she took to social media and reached out to the pop star who's now changed the lyric of her song. This is someone who has like millions of followers, sells millions of records worldwide. The potential for positive change and for people to actually be heard is remarkable. Not to mention for, on a smaller scale, just those, those magic moments of people finding communities that they would otherwise never have found where they can belong. And I'd say that's especially true of young people in regional settings, um, regional and remote settings as well. Um, so yeah, the potential is remarkable. We're seeing like teens starting careers before they've finished school. And I'm not talking about careers as TikTok influencers, although power to those people that make it. I'm, I'm seeing people coding websites and starting social enterprises. Nick, I know that's like a huge, technology plays a huge role in getting products to market um, for, for many teens. And so it's such a leveler. And in a world of so much disruption, what we're seeing is that social media and emerging technologies can actually be a positive disruption to the traditional power structures that have held many young people back as well gosh i'm still watching like instagram reels which are like tiktoks from six weeks ago that have made it there so i need to like get on my game and like get in get into some of these other social medias which actually leads me to uh, i'm going to dig into drop your questions in i'm going to lean into a couple of others what do you think as whether we're caregivers or teachers what are some strategies that we can as an individual that we can put into play to support young people in their online use like is there something that i can do whether i'm an educator or a caregiver with young people that are accessing the online world what are some key things that we can do to kind of support young people in this space the first thing that comes to mind is around um young people's expectations when they reach out for help i think that um and I, I've had to check myself massively on this, but I have some younger family members who have come to me knowing my the, my role and my, my career. And even for me, I find it's like when you're worried about someone, a hot button is pushed and you want to take control and take over and fix the situation. And for educators, the challenge is that that's actually your role. When a young person comes to you for help, you need to take action and fix the situation. But I think for so many teens, especially when it comes to tech and social media, the problem Problems that they're seeing and they're experiencing aren't in spaces that are navigated by adults. And so the number one barrier for them in coming forward is the fear that the technology will be taken away that it will, or that the problem will be made worse. 
um, or that they'll lose agency altogether. And the the device is what's given them agency, give, whether it's real or, or not, whether that's true or not, it's given them a sense that they have control and choice in their lives. And so um, the very first and most important thing that I've learned and I'm still learning is that um, the most powerful act, um, it's, it's probably true of time memorial, but especially when it comes to technology, is to resist leaping into action, to resist um, jumping to any conclusions. Often young people won't come forward because they're worried because they've actually played a role in, in their own negative experience and they're worried they're going to get in trouble there. So it's about just holding that space and recognizing, you know, that old um, saying that there are always two sides to the story. When it comes to digital, there's like 2.3 billion sides to the story because there's always more than two people involved. And so it's, I think the challenge for us when we're hearing young people's experience is to just sit in the complexity and to just listen um, and, and to where we can ask, how did this make you feel? In an ideal world, what would you like to be done about this? Um, because otherwise I'm concerned that we're starting to create spaces where to talk up is to initiate action, to come forward and ask for help is to lose control or lose agency over the way your situation's managed. And so, yeah, I just think that first step is really important. Um, the second thing is a resource that I'd really recommend checking out. You're, you might be aware of it, but a lot of people aren't. And that's um, checking out the office of the eSafety Commissioner, because we are incredibly lucky in this country to have a dedicated independent regulator, which is the world's first government agency of its kind, dedicated to keeping people safer online. Um, the problem is that they're they're a great agency, but not they don't have great community awareness. They can help out with getting harmful or illegal content or image-based abuse taken down, even if it's been reported to the platform and the platform's done nothing about it. They have great resources for for parents and families. So if parents are coming to you struggling with things like setting screen limits or agreeing on how the family navigates technology, they've got great templates like family tech agreements and that kind of thing. Um, and finally, of course, if, for young people who are struggling, I'd encourage them to connect with Project Rocket and our online community. They can they head to our YouTube channel. We have a whole bunch of episodes that they can watch privately um, that cover some of the more difficult topics that aren't talked about in schools. And if they want a, a thread of positivity to show up in their newsfeed, then just they can just check us a follow on TikTok or Instagram as well. I think it's about not just shutting down the harm, but making sure that when you put, when you open up this device as you're heading out the school gates, you get a rush of positivity and support and community um, to kind of offset whatever difficult experiences you might be having. Yeah, curating the feed, hey? So critical. Um, That's it. So I want to show, I know Monty's got a question here, and if anybody else has questions for this last sort of six minutes, feel free to kind of drop them in here. <laughs> Monty's also taken your nickname um, and moving it forward, which I think is great. I might have to do the same. Um, Monty's question is, like, do you think these programs, um, because obviously it's, like, labelled around, like, online safety and bullying, do you really think that this is about dealing with some of the issues in the domestic violence or healthy relationship space. And I think this is kind of what you were alluding to earlier when you were talking about this broader concern. Is this really what we're talking about here in a lot of ways? I, look, there's a really strong longitudinal link between bullying, school bullying and family violence among a whole raft of other issues, both for those who perpetrate school bullying and those who experience it. Um, the label of bully and victim do no nobody any justice. Um, and so really the kind of conversations that underpin bullying are the same as those that underpin the kind of family violence piece as well. They're about power, they're about conflict management, they're about equity in relationships. I see huge cut through. Um, one of the challenges we've had is that um, getting into schools the issue of bullying, it's like almost codified by schools and governments and policymakers and definitely in the curriculum um, as well that there's a, it's really accepted that bullying happens in schools. It's really visible and it's something that irrespective of the sector that you're working in or your politics, every parent every is, is concerned that they don't want their kid to have a negative or hateful experience at school or online. Whereas some of the other issues that come under family violence seem to be much more politicised in this country, which is a crying shame. I'd also say the same about many other issues connected to bullying. For example, running workshops and education around racism. It's a lot more difficult to get those conversations off the ground or supporting same-sex attracted and gender diverse students. 
but really they come back to the same root cause, which is about people um, having the, I guess, the acceptance of themselves and the healthy emotional literacy and the role modeling and the early childhood experiences that mean they can have healthy and respectful relationships with others. In a way, the technology piece and the cyber safety piece is just an overlay. It's just a filter over the top of all of that, but, but these are the same issues. So I see really strong parallels. And for us, in a way, the words bullying and cyber bullying have been a safe avenue through which uh, decision makers, and I'd say at a, at a kind of government level, um, but also in schools have, have felt they can really, can really get behind um, the work that Project Rocket's doing. There's, there's a lot more work that needs to be done a lot earlier, though, I'd say, in this space. And, and in, a, in a much more kind of um, full on and, and like direct way than Project Rocket's doing. Um, I think Angeline wrote a comment right at the same time as you kind of worded this, but she was saying, do, do you see the connection between like family life and, and I guess how young people, that I guess their coping mechanisms for some of these challenges in friendship being the product of how they've seen that modelled um, at home. Is that correlation strong, I guess, in the way that young people choose to cope? Yes. And in terms of responses to bullying, we've seen 20 years ago, you know, there was this whole, um, oh, like hype around zero tolerance policies to bullying. And that moved away. The trend became around restorative practice where you'd um, sit the you know, the person who's doing the bullying down with people who are affected and they explain how they feel. There's challenges with both of these, um, both of these approaches, because as you've named, as you've acknowledged um, in the chat, Angeline, it all comes back to affirming or providing alternative ways of behaving from what you've learnt in childhood. So if you've learnt that when you do something bad and you're punished and you don't care, or maybe that's your way of getting attention because you've had your needs neglected, it only validates that behaviour. So that's the issue with the punishment model. The issue with the restorative model is that many many young people, they, they know the harm they're causing. And so in a way, having the opportunity to sit down and have the person who's been victimised by them share the impact, it's almost validate, validating what they were seeking out. So in a way, it's almost like we, we, we need to um, have a think about, yes, how we're responding to these situations. I'd say that a case-by-case approach is really what we're starting to see emerging in schools but also it's about developing that yeah that emotional literacy that kind of citizenship and a sense of kind of humanity education if that's if that's a, a term i could just throw in the mix there but um yeah it absolutely comes back to the, the things we've learned early on and one of the things that project rocket strives to do is provide what psychologists call it a corrective emotional experience um, and so to give you an example of what that looks like, if you've always been taught that you're the bad kid, it's about creating a space where the minute you do something, that, a behaviour we want to see, you're rewarded and included and celebrated for it. If you've been taught that you're invisible and your opinion doesn't matter, we try and cultivate safe ways through a lot of, um, it's not Project Rocket workshops aren't all through discussion, they're through activities and participation. So before you know it, you're trying something new you haven't tried before, you're being validated, you're seeing that that actually led to a connection with your peers and that's being reinforced. So it's about providing, I think, alternative ways of finding, like at the end of the day, we all just want connection and we all want to belong and be accepted. And so it's finding alternative ways to actually gain that. Gosh, I could really go on quite a tangent from here for some length of time, but I'm acutely aware that time is wrapping down. So to sort of finish, Luce, I'd love, you've mentioned a couple of key um, resources, which will pop in the wrap up from today's session and make sure everybody gets access to. Is there anything else that you've not mentioned that teachers or maybe even young people like spaces, places, podcasts, books, any other like wish list resources that you like? If I could package together some good content for you to jump into, um, aside from the ones you've mentioned, I'd also recommend heading here. Love it. I'm going to give you two books. Um, the first book is many of you will have come across it already, um, but it's about trauma and I'm just acknowledging that bullying is trauma. And in a way we've over the past couple of years, we've all gone through some degree of trauma, but this is the best book I've ever read about understanding trauma and the way it manifests. And it's called the body keeps the score by Bessel van der Kolk. 
And it's basically that the title says, it does what it says on the tin. It's this idea that, um, you know, our, our experiences, our emotional experiences are visceral. They're, they're manifested um, in our bodies. And so, yeah, it's a very, it's, it's an interesting departure from talking therapies and thinking about how we can heal. But it, it, it offered a lot to me in understanding our work and our role in supporting people through traumatic experiences and adversity. Um, the next one, though, is a novel for, for teens and young adults that I bloody love. Um, and it's called Lorinda by Alice Pong. If you've, if anyone's come across it, she's a wonderful Australian author. Lorin, there's, Lorinda is, she's Melbourne based. And then the title is the name of an all girls school, a fictional all girls school that happens to res very closely resemble the real name of a Melbourne based all girls school. And it's about the politics of navigating as um, it, it talks about kind of class and socioeconomic adversity as well as race in, a, in that kind of all, all girls school environment. But it's very funny. It's got a lot of that kind of larrikin. It's got, in a way, the humor is a little bit Kath and Kim, I'm going to say as well, if you're into that. Um, and it's actually coming, if, if anyone's interested, it is being developed into a, um, a, a stage show as well. It's um, a really, really awesome, it's like an updated version of Mean Girls without all the stereotypes and, and hyper drama. It's, it's, it's really fantastic. I'd recommend it. I'll add to cart. Um, the body keeps the score is a favorite. We love that. Um, but now adding Lorinda to cart. So um, we'll pop that on the list and we'll also drop this into um, a bit of a, you'll get an email after today that kind of packages together all the good stuff that Lucy's mentioned so that you can go on a little jaunt down research lane. If you want to look into some of these things a little bit further. Lucy, thank you. I genuinely think we could have spoken for another 45 minutes. You have this miraculous way of explaining really complex concepts in really simple ways, but also in a rich way for educators and others to be able to kind of take what you've said and then draw some really purposeful things out of it moving forward. So I just want to say that I think time is the greatest gift we can give people because it's the one resource we don't have an unlimited amount of. So thank you for carving out a little bit of your time to share your experiences and your advice with us. Thank you so much for having me and lovely to have the opportunity to share some learning and yarns with you. Thank you. Our pleasure. We'll also pop all the links for you to get in contact with Project Rocket directly if you would like to tap into Lucy and her team as well. Our next live learning session next month, we're actually diving into something a little bit different. We're going to talk about creativity and why as humans we are so scared of creativity. We attach things like art and music to it without realising that creativity is probably the backbone um, of a critical capability that we need to navigate life. Um, so we're going to take a deep dive into the scary space of creativity and how we can build it within ourselves and also within the young people in our classroom. Thank you for today, wherever you are in the world. I hope your day finishes with something lovely that you enjoy and um, look forward to seeing you in our next live learning session. Have a great afternoon.